This episode of Engineering Change is sponsored by Burns & McDonald, constructing the vital connections of our world, from communications to critical infrastructure, is what Burns & McDonald is all about. For over 125 years, our teams have worked together to deliver innovative, environmentally conscious, and socially responsible construction and design projects. See how our growing team in the Southeast is designed to build. Visit burnsmcd.com slash Atlanta Careers. The following episode was recorded during the 2024 Georgia Engineers Summer Conference at Disney's Contemporary Resort. Because this episode was recorded live, sound quality may vary. Welcome to the 2024 Georgia Engineers Summer Conference. From designing cutting edge infrastructure to solving complex environmental challenges, Georgia's engineers are at the forefront of progress. The roads we drive on, the bridges we cross, and the systems that keep our water clean and safe ensure our communities are resilient and sustainable. Georgia's engineers transform visions into reality, making our state a leader in engineering excellence. Get ready to experience best-in-class, business-focused content that boosts your firm's bottom line and connects you with industry leaders, all focused on the business of engineering. Let's build the future of engineering together. Welcome to the Engineering Change Podcast. I'm Brett Hillesheim, your host, and I'm here with my co-host, the goofy to my Pluto, Michael Sully Sullivan. Definitely goofy. Definitely goofy. And we're in a little bit different location. Um, we are recording. Um, I always want to say recording live, but I mean, if it's recording, it's not really live. But we are alive. I mean, that's fair. Yes. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. This is live now. Yeah. It's live now. And we are recorded before a live studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> that is we correct. Are, we are the Georgia. No laugh tracks. No laugh tracks. Um, that's because we're not funny. Um, <laughs> We are recording at the Georgia Engineer Summer Conference, which is hosted at Walt Disney World this year at the Contemporary Resort. And uh, we are joined here uh, by Commissioner Russell McMurray, who we just heard present during the general session. Uh, Sully, you want to give Russell a brief introduction? You know, one of my pet peeves is when you say someone who needs no introduction and then people proceed to do like three paragraphs of an introduction. <laughs> That's right, right. That's got, it's kind of inconsistent. But uh, Russell McMurray is, of course, the, uh, the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Transportation, commissioner since 2015. Um, prior to that, he served in a variety of roles within the Department of Transportation. Um, in fact, the Department of Transportation is the only place you've worked since you graduated from college, right? That's correct. And yeah. I appreciate you not doing the full obituary. So <laughs> it's nice. Um, yeah, so has risen up through the ranks to, uh, to become the commissioner and uh, is, uh, is widely regarded around the country as one of the best commissioners of any Department of Transportation anywhere. And uh, I would certainly echo those feelings. And it's uh, a point of pride for me when I meet with my colleagues from around the country that uh, are commiserating about their Department <laughs> of Transportation uh, to be able to talk about the, uh, the wonderful uh, things that the Georgia Department of Transportation is doing. And uh, so uh, you talked a little bit this morning about uh, something that happened seven years ago. And uh, so I remember where I was seven years ago. I was, yeah. I was down at the state capitol. Uh, it was signy die, which is the last day of the legislative session. And uh, that's a weird day in and of itself in, in, in any session, but it's definitely the weirdest signy die I can remember uh, because sometime in the late afternoon, people started whispering and talking and huddling. Uh, and they were doing that because the I 85 bridge was on fire. And, right. uh, and yeah. so we were getting little snippets of information, but. Uh, uh, you referred to the fog of war this morning. I yeah. think we were definitely right. in the fog of war at the Capitol. Nobody really knew what was happening. Um, but, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that sure. story. Well, uh, it's sunny die is an interesting day. And as, <laughs> as I recall, too, now, you know, getting some feedback later, you know, you could see the smoke from the Capitol. I mean, this I was think a, some people said that this they could, was yeah. a oh, wow. big plume of smoke. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it certainly was a big event. And, uh, you called it an interesting day. I don't know that it was an interesting day for me. It was certainly a challenging day. As, as I said this morning in the general session, I said, have you ever had a bad day at work? You know, and this certainly 
started as a very bad day at work uh, when, you know, you have a major piece of infrastructure collapse. Uh, you know, I believe about 243,000 cars a day traversed wow. 85 at that time. And uh, obviously with that collapse, it was severed. So, um, you know, uh, the fog of war I referred to was uh, when you don't know all the facts, you know, and, and you've got limited information, but you need to be actionable. And it's really a wartime reference uh, when, you know, you're on the battlefield and all you see what's in front of you. So, uh, yeah, that night was, uh, that night was uh, some challenge. And uh, as I said this morning, I'd actually had gone home, which is unusual for a sine die. I mean, we were just – it was just that low key of a legislative Josh session had for everything us. under control. That's right. <laughs> uh, in great hands as always. He's like Allstate. You know, he's in good – always in good Shout hands. Shout out to Josh Waller. That's right. <laughs> And so uh, little did I know, you know, by the time I got home and turned on the TV news and actually the TV was on in my home <laughs> with nobody watching, pet peeve of mine, by the way. Uh, so uh, anyway, when I saw the skycopter shot of a huge fire just engulfing 85, I knew that bridge was severely compromised uh, and knew that ultimately it would fail, uh, which is tragic. Uh, but again, thanks. so much thanks uh, goes to the first responders of Atlanta mm -hmm. PD and the Georgia State Patrol and our heroes, in fact, of getting Interstate 85 shut down. And if you recall, you can go, probably can still go uh, pull up some YouTube videos of people driving through that with mm -hmm. fire yeah. coming around oh, yeah. both sides. Yeah, like, I remember that. It's yeah. like, you know, uh, going through the fires of hell or something and people <laughs> are still driving across it. But uh Anyway, but thank goodness they got every got it shut down, and there was nobody hurt or injured. And you know, I wouldn't have been able to share that story this morning uh, with sort of uh, you know all the stories about '85 if anybody had been hurt or injured. We just we just simply couldn't talk about it. Which again, that's the first and best success that nobody was hurt or injured. And I'll be eternally grateful for those first responders who did such a great job. And uh, but that was just the beginning, you know. Yeah. And then then we had to start on dealing with all the issues that uh, goes along with a major unexpected, you know, emergency. Uh, that wasn't in your uh, your your contingency plans. Uh, yeah, major yeah. interstate highway being yeah, shut down. Absolutely. You know, as, <laughs> as I mentioned, you know, we didn't have this exact scenario in our playbook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what was very important is to have practices and procedures and protocols that you can rely on and then adjust. Mm -hmm. And if you think that, you know, DOT, Georgia DOT is responsible for over 7,000 bridges across the state. So it's hard to have 7,000 contingency plans. Uh, but we uh, basically relied on what we do during uh, snow and ice events. Yes, we have those in Georgia from time to time. <laughs> Uh, and tornadoes and hurricanes and, you know, extreme weather events that we have to deal with is we stand up uh, our operations center over at our traffic management center. And further, you know, if it's a statewide emergency, then GEMA has their operations center set up, and we're next door, which is wonderful because we're just side by side with GEMA Homeland Security. But that was our strategy. Okay, we stood up our operations center and brought in some different players to the uh, to the fun, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, including bringing Atlanta PD in uh, with uh, GEMA and Homeland Security, uh, State Patrol, uh, and uh, brought in our bridge engineers, which is not you don't usually need a bridge engineer for a, a for an emergency for yeah. a tornado <laughs> or hurricane, uh, yeah. but we brought them in knowing that this was a bridge issue and. Um, in our communications team and, and actually city of Atlanta, uh, some of their staff, transportation staff at the times, uh, because at that time, back to that fog of war, we literally didn't know what had caused this. Now, we started doing what every investigative journalist were doing. We mm -hmm. went to Google Earth <laughs> and said, <laughs> what's under this bridge? And then we saw that, you know, we had stored lots of rolls of HDPE conduit under the bridge uh, to keep it out of the elements, and it was behind a locked chain link fence. So I always underscore that. Mm -hmm. There was a fence around this, and it was locked. Uh, but as we now know, uh, you know that there was a drug deal somehow went bad, and for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, somebody took a, a couch, lit it on fire, and leaned it against the conduit, which then caught on fire, and then it just 
one roll or spool caught the next spool on fire, caught the next spool, so it was like a domino effect. So we had quite an inferno of a very high heat in intensity, uh, you know, that ultimately caused, you know, damage to the bridge and the ultimate collapse of the uh, northbound lanes and damage not un- enough. Not unreasonable that you hadn't foreseen a flaming couch as <laughs> one of the yeah. contingencies. Uh, a <laughs> flaming couch from a drug deal. <laughs> That's yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, uh, you know, with all, with all due respect to that situation, you know, we, we got really good at talking about using words like combustible, mm-hmm. which is different than flammable. So uh, combustible means you have to put an accelerant with it to make it catch on fire. Flammable is obviously it'll catch on fire. Right. So uh, anyway, so, you know, a lot of messaging, a lot of those things. But the the point of that was to stand up our operations center and be communicative. And one of the things I talked about this morning was being able to have one voice of truth, as I like to call it, is that the messaging could be the same throughout. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, also today, you know, in your session, uh, you had a, a, a focus on culture and, uh, you know, and how interacting with people and communicating is so critical. And having everybody at one place at one time was just critical at that time as things were unfolding real time. And you could get the most accurate information. You didn't, you know, it wasn't the old daisy chain of mm-hmm. I got to call this person, I got to call that person. You were getting report out real time and that became a real benefit when something was happening as fast as it was well but let's explore that because that the story of that really goes way back before uh the bridge collapse yeah the collaboration and communication that you had existing with other agency heads other departments the city of atlanta the governor's office talk a little bit about that collaboration and how quickly uh, the, the the folks that needed to get together got together and were making decisions yeah. in real time. Believe it or not, it goes back to sort of another another uh, event, which was the snowpocalypse or snowmageddon <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, back in 2014. And from that, we actually did build a lot better communications among other state entities and agencies. And, uh, and that really was foundational for the success of uh, responding to 85 is we had those procedures and protocols uh, that we stood up. And, you know, going back to that time, I was in a different role. I was chief engineer back then. And, you know, Governor Dill at the time really focused on how do we have state, more state collaboration when we have events like that. Obviously, DOT in a snow event has a big role in response, but we don't have the only role. Uh, so, uh, so that was foundational that helped in the 85 and that gave us the, the ability to pivot. And like I said, you know, we didn't have it in a playbook to deal with a bridge collapse on 85, but we were able to then pivot from, from our operational sort of SOPs to deploy and be responsive in this case. And also the trust of the leaders, because you can imagine a scenario in previous years, we'll say decades ago, where... Uh, everyone would have wanted to get in front of the cameras sure. or other entities would also want to get their yeah. messaging out. That trust that you get created. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that trust is earned and it, it comes with work. And, you know, we had a great relations with the governor's chief of staff. We had a great relations with uh, Mayor Reed's chief of staff and Mayor Reed. And then from there, everybody sort of fell in line. And, and one of the important things to us was, uh, like I said earlier, is we need to voice one message of truth. And uh, I was very appreciative that the mayor deferred to the governor who deferred to DOT, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, uh, obviously they did state, a few statements, uh, and, but it wasn't, a, you know, on a daily basis, it was DOT and our staff working with their staff, including Marta's staff, because obviously moving people became more important as ever. And, you know, messaging to use Marta and transit and to get around this area became a big part. So uh, between the city, Marta, you know, and DOT, we did a lot of that uh, PIO messaging, working together collaboratively to message the same thing. You know, you want to you want one message out there that the public can understand and translate and not have mixed messages and different agendas, you know. And so, uh, again, I can't say enough to the leadership, also uh, leadership at MARTA at the time, um, uh, tremendous uh, there for partnership and working together. But uh, that becomes critical. And as I said uh, this morning, you know, 
you can't wait to emergency to figure out who you need to phone yeah. or you make an introduction to somebody that says, hello, I'm Russell. I've got a bridge collapse. Uh, can you help? You know, so I think we take that for granted often, but uh, I know one of the tenants ACEC is connections mm -hmm. and you've got to have those mm -hmm. connections. And it's just foundational that you have those connections that, you know, when you need a, when you need a friend, you can text or call and they know they'll pick up the phone because when they know you're texting or calling, it's important, and uh, I can't underscore that how incredible and important that is. And I can't underscore how, I won't say unique, but but unique that is. You know, when I talk to my colleagues from around the country, that kind of collaboration is not the norm in other states. Yeah. We really are fortunate, and we take it for granted. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we do, and I have the pleasure of knowing a lot of my colleagues around the nation, and it just sort of baffles me why you know DOTs and cities and other entities, transit agencies don't work together. And, and again, we, we built on, we continue to build on some past experience. Actually going back to 2010 to 2012 was when the region was doing the regional uh, sales tax initiative, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but from that, uh, GDOT, the Atlanta Regional Commission, MARTA, City of Atlanta, uh, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, among others, build a coalition that we had regular meetings, and we still do that today. We still mm -hmm. have regular meetings with MARTA, Greta, now the ATL as well, mm -hmm. uh, and GDOT uh, to coordinate and bring in the city of Atlanta as well to coordinate about all the things going on transportation related. And again, that's part of that part of that uh, communication network that you have to have when something mm -hmm. goes awry. You really, you know, it's time to call call a friend, as they say. Yeah. Well, that's a great example, you know, even though the TIA campaign uh, was, was not successful in the metro Atlanta region, and I was the treasurer of the TIA campaign, so that still brings back some, <laughs> some flashbacks. I noticed that rea reaction. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tick. I'll, I'll get over it eventually. Um, but there was, there was a lot of good that came from that, not only that collaboration, the communication, the regionalism that I think it created in Atlanta that didn't exist before, but frankly, had we not had the failure of TIA, we probably would not have had the success of House Bill 170 I agree. just a few years later. Yeah. And given the choice between TIA and 170, I'll definitely choose 170 right. every time. In the same way, you know, obviously the bridge burning and collapsing is, is a tra was a, a tragedy. Again, no loss of life or injury, um, but it was also an opportunity. 46 days later, that bridge was right. open to traffic, um, but there was a lot that happened between the bridge burning and the bridge reopening. Um, including a lot of, uh, you know, uh, in real time engineering decisions and design right. and fabrication. Let's get in a little bit to, sure. uh, you know, and get highly technical, but it is engineering sure. change podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Let's get into some of that, some of the challenges yeah. that you had to overcome in that process. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'm just so proud of our team at GDOD and everybody's involved, contractors, suppliers, anybody that was involved, just so proud of the outcome and how, how this translate it to success, but it was a lot of work. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk just about a bridge engineering just for a moment and our bridge engineers, you know, obviously, you know, you have a bridge collapse, uh, you've got severe structural damage. Ultimately, we had to take out, you know, multiple spans of bridges that due to being compromised and rebuild, but the fire was so hard, hot, it was damaged to the columns, the, the concrete basically had spalled off. You could see the reinforcing steel. I mean, it just looked like a skeleton of a bridge uh, left, the, the part that didn't collapse. So, uh, you know, you would think, okay, well, we'll just go find the old bridge plans <laughs> and just go rebuild that. Pretty simple. <laughs> and uh, no, you know, nothing is quite as Nothing is simple anymore. And uh, the fact of the matter was the top of bridge to beam designs that that bridge had hadn't been built since like the 80s or 90s. So no manufacturer had those kind of forms anymore or that design is something that's we're not, we just don't do anymore. So, you know, so we had to uh, redesign beams. Uh, and the first thing we did actually was like, do we have any beams on any construction project <laughs> anywhere <laughs> That would be the right length. And uh, as not luck, I don't know, fate would have it, I guess you'd say, is uh, the span over Piedmont Road, Road is a trapezoidal shape. So most spans are parallel and same equal distance, and each beam is the same length. But no, every beam was a unique length, which meant it had to be a unique design and had to be fabricated uniquely 
which added more time. Uh, so, you know, so nothing easy there. And then the columns, uh, the bridge support columns uh, were severely damaged. So the good news were they were able to do a retrofit and salvage those without have to tearing them all out and starting over. Uh, but took a lot of work and that, that helped. The foundations were fa- fine because they were buried underground and protected from the heat. But uh, listen, the, the thing that I'm so proud of was how our bridge engineers came together literally on Friday of understanding what it was that we had to do. Uh, and it took, it took a while to figure out what we had to do and how bad the damage was. Uh, a couple things I didn't talk about this morning was that the fire was so intense and there's soot, soot, right? So the whole bridge was just blackened with soot. We actually had to get pressure washers. Wow. Once the bridge was cool enough to get into, to pressure wash the beams so that you could see the damage. Oh, wow. wow. And so just things you don't think about. And the, the other thing, too, as it re- related to the inspection before the engineering began was uh, – as the fire was being put out, it remained very hot. And I remember seeing guardrail under the bridge and the bolts to the guardrail were still gro- gl- glowing red. Oh, wow. That's how hot it was. So when steel is glowing red, it's very hot. Wow. Ge- Georgia Power had a couple of power lines in that area, a big transmission line and a distribution line. And they had their, they had their really big, nice drones out. And so they were trying to fly the lines to see if there was soot and damage to their lines. So we asked them if they could fly up under the bridge, and they had really good cameras, good high-quality drone, and uh, so we could try to start our bridge inspection. And they said, yeah, we'd be glad to, but they couldn't. There's so much heat that they couldn't control wow. their, their drones, so they, they lost their lift wow. due to the heat. So we couldn't, we couldn't even get in there. So it took, it took you know, a couple of days to be able to understand what we had for bridge engineers to start their work. Now... The thing that was really neat about the bridge engineering was, you know, that they identified what they needed to do. And as I said, we just couldn't use our normal plans and start over. So one of the things very important, knowing how critical it was to get open, was we asked our bridge engineers, as soon as you can get a detail or spec or material information uh, ready, let's go ahead and transmit that over to the contractor so that they could begin their ordering the materials and supplies and fabricating the parts. And to me, as I said this morning, it's probably the most truest design bill real time project I've mm-hmm. ever seen mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, we don't traditionally send out partial pieces of a design, and especially bridge. We like to have the complete plans. We've been reviewed and QA'd mm-hmm. and QC'd a couple of times. You know, then you get a full set of plans. But they were literally sending details. And also, as we sent things over the contractor, they let us know if that might be hard or difficult, could we do something a little different? So it's truly iterative. And literally by Friday through the weekend till like 1.30 a.m. Monday morning, they completed the full set of plans and were communicating that back and forth to the contractor. You know, but there's a lot of things, a lot of stories I couldn't tell. Like, oh, yeah, our building shuts off the heat and heat and air on the weekends and they were in the building trying to do designs all weekend, <laughs> weekend. so we had to get the oh, building to turn the heat and air back on because the bridge engineers were about to pass out you know <laughs> and then trying to get them some food you know trying to you know they they literally worked around the clock which is just an amazing outcome and as i shared this morning i've got a photo i used in some of my presentations i really love and this was bill Duvall, who was the state bridge engineer at the time and the team of young bridge engineers around him. And it truly was that multi-generational, you know, workforce that we talk about so often, and they did it, you know, and they came together as a team with laser focus, you know, and so, so proud of what they did and working so hard. And then the other part of that is, if you think about the business we're in, usually it takes years to do projects, Mm -hmm. but they got to see their designs being built Mm -hmm. in, you know, six weeks. Yeah. And so, and they were able to go out onto the project as well to see how their designs were being incorporated into the work. And then, true too, too, as we ran into issues, they were able to quickly adjust and work with the contractor if we needed to make an adjustment. And they were just simply right down the street, uh, and they could actually see the work, which very rarely happens for bridge engineers. You know, mm-hmm. they once they complete one design, they're on to their next next bridge yeah you know, but, but they got to see how it played out so it was very rewarding for them as well yeah i mean that's another example of uh 
mentoring and learning that was unique, but that will continue to pay dividends for some of those engineers for decades to come. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just being, you know, immersed in such a situation and working so hard and being so focused on, you know, getting this bridge back rebuilt as quickly as possible is, yeah. I mean, you got literally probably years of experience in uh, two or three days. <laughs> Speaking of young engineers and the connections and stuff you form, was there a particular mentor that you can look back to in your younger days that during this experience, you just relied on that that leadership advice that they gave you yeah for for this event you know it's a combination of mm-hmm. so many people and I, I don't even want to start naming people because i've had so many people that have positively influenced me and uh, you know and and listen at the time you know we're just responding you know it's right. just you're, we're just taking care of business and you know you don't think about the, the leadership or management of what you're doing, you're just trying to address the situation in front of you. So I would say there's, uh, you know, just a combination of great leaders. I've had the great fortune to work with mm-hmm. along the way that, you know, I've taken away, uh, you know, tidbits from and learn from. And, you know, I watch a lot of people's style, and, mm-hmm. you know, and see how they, how they respond and, you know, I probably don't have the best style. I, I, uh, you ask my team, I'm, I, I, dem- I sort of demand excellence and, uh, <laughs> you know, don't have much patience for anything less than uh, excellence. And so, uh, but throughout this situation, it was just, you know, a, a team approach. And listen, it, you know, this was so many people at GDOT, you know, I can't say enough about Meg Perkle and Mike Dover and just go, I mean, I can just go down the list of everybody was so focused. And, and that's one of the things I've talked about is when you've got a very clear mission, mm-hmm. it makes thing, makes a lot easier for people to execute. Yeah. And the mission was so laser clear of what we had to do. Everybody was in that alignment. And then, you know, the other part of that that made, uh, hopefully made it a lot uh, easier for people to do their jobs was, you know, we did, and I did say, I want every issue solved at the lowest level possible as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And that meant on the project side as the rebuild was going on from the construction folks. Now we brought in, we brought in construction liaison. So we had sort of the best knowledge base we could have on bridge construction there. And one guy left his house from South Georgia and stayed all six weeks. He, he didn't go home. I, he might have wow. gone home for like a day or two. But we had, you know, we had people that could solve problems. But if something needed to be escalated, we said, okay, escalate it to the top. Mm-hmm. Now, that did cause some heartburn of, you know, sort of the normal chain of command. And, you know, some people didn't get the opportunity to solve it. That I felt like they probably could solve it. Right. But we just didn't have time for indecision. And we just didn't have time to go through the normal process uh, that could drag things down. And, and uh, you know, this morning from my conversation, that takes a lot of trust. Mm-hmm. And, um, and trust is earned, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you've got you to gotta have confidence in your team to allow that to happen. And, uh, look, I had, you know, total confidence in the team. Uh, now, confidence comes with checks and balances. So we had literally daily calls, multiple daily calls, and or meetings about where do we stand, where, where are we at on our progress. And, and if, there's, if there's some issue emerging, um, you know, we'll, we'll address it and it's not the blame game. You know, we're mm-hmm. not gonna blame anybody. We're gonna say, okay, let's move forward. Let's solve the problem. We don't have time to look back. We can only look ahead. And so I think that became very key as well you know, to just basically empower people to do their jobs and, and know that they can do it and if there's an issue you know it will escalate it get it soft so we move on yeah yeah how do you think this event changed your leadership style and after after it was done moving forward that's a really good question um i don't know that i have pondered that much because at the time you're just you're reacting in you're yeah. in you're in the you're in the middle of the game so to speak and so you know i, I I don't know. That's a really good question. If it's changed my style or mm-hmm. not, uh, it certainly has impacted. You know, certainly impacted uh, what I've done. And obviously, you know, I, I get to be the face of recognition, and, mm-hmm. and that's very humbling. Because I assure you, as I've told many people, I didn't do one thing. I didn't design one aspect of the redesign. I didn't touch one piece of the rebar. I didn't do any of the concrete work. 
you know, I just get to be a face of the hard work so that so many people did and, and in the agency of GDOT and the contractors and suppliers. So that's a really good question. I'll have to ponder that more if, if it actually changed me. I'm sure it changed me in some ways, mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know, one, one thing I think is very important is uh, – uh, don't get excited, you know, just you, you got to keep calm and, mm-hmm. and stay focused. And now I, 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 my face probably turns different shades of red. <laughs> I have a, don't have a great poker face, so people can read me pretty quick if I'm frustrated or mad. But uh, you got to stay calm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, think that's, I think that's one of the aspects that was very important, too, is you just got to, you know, people react to, to where you are. And if mm-hmm. you're agitated or excited or you know, yelling or jumping up and down, then, you know, it's probably not a place people want to be. So right. if we can stay calm and stay focused, then we can get a lot done. So great question. I'll, I'll ponder that more. <laughs> we'll save it for part two when you come back. Okay, okay. fair enough. <laughs> well, Commissioner, do you have any, uh, you, you know, talked a lot about you know, extrapolating, maybe not the right word, but lessons learned mm-hmm. from this experience, leadership lessons yeah. learned. Do you have any you know, words of wisdom relative Fav- to leadership. Favorite nuggets of truth. <laughs> Favorite sure. nuggets of truth. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, Tully, so you mentioned a few things. You said it a couple times just this morning. Um, it was collaboration and communication. Hmm. And I, I just think that's really foundational. And, and what I saw emerge out of, out of the 85 rebuild was one of a culture of collaboration, first and foremost, because we sort of made it mandatory. Mm-hmm. I like to say that communication is mandatory. Mm-hmm. And then innovation and how things were able to be done so fast and innovatively that that only came after the communication part of that and the mm-hmm. collabor- collaboration. So I think that was one of the biggest things I, I looked at. And as we focus on culture, and you, you had a session today on culture, as we focus on the culture at GDOT, that was one of the takeaways that we're trying to continue to keep that momentum on now seven years later of a culture of collaboration and innovation. Mm-hmm. And we challenge our, our, our staff uh, in those sort of, in that, in that uh, culture regime of wanting to make sure that people are collaborative, working across offices and trying to do that. And we have a lot of offices and divisions that are doing amazing things. And uh, I'm not gonna call out a specific office but or division, but th- we have people trying to, you know, cross-pollinate, understand what other offices do. You know, it's easy to get siloed into your day-to-day, but understand the bigger vision, the bigger emphasis of how your work touches other things that ultimately turns into success for the public for a transportation purpose. And so trying to trying to be collaborative and communicative, I think, is very important. Uh, we have a management development course that I'm, I'm so proud of. It's a two-week course that... Uh, you know, you go away for a week and you go back into your work, go back to your normal work area for a couple of weeks and you come back for another week. And inside that, we have something that's like Shark Tank where we take those, that group of about 20 to 30 people in the cohort and put them into three teams. And they simply have to come up with a project to make something better at GDOT or that's for really GDOT. Cool. That's really cool. And, uh, and it's amazing mm-hmm. to see what those teams come back with. And we've made so many adjustments to things we do internally or even externally for that matter that came from that work. Uh, but like Shark Tank, you have to pitch your project to uh, myself, to a chief engineer, to our treasurer, and to our deputy commissioner. And so we're the sharks. They pitch the projects. They do a presentation. And Pitch, pitch the projects, and now you get a shark. And so one of us, uh, myself, Deputy Commissioner, Chief Engineer, Treasurer, goes with the teams to help them fulfill and be their advisor to actually implement the work they do. You know, and one of the things I tell them when we do the teams is one of the greatest things of influence is if you can, if you can implement change or influence outside of what you have direct control on. Mm-hmm. Then you become a leader. If you're, if you get the, you know, as a leader, if you can effectively af- affect change outside of what you have direct control over, that's leadership. And so uh, these teams are all made up of different people. You've got people in accounting. You may have somebody in HR. You may have somebody in engineering. All on one team. 
and whatever they're working on is probably foreign to all of them. And so it's really a neat opportunity and it's just something we're super proud of. And, and not, not only that, you know, that's the, again, trying to build that culture and know that they can do that. You know, it's sort of, uh, sort of like the uh, Georgia Tech uh, viral sensation, you know, four or five years ago, you know, you can do that. You know, if you oh, go right. to Georgia Tech, yeah. you can do that. Yeah. And that's what I tell those teams is, look, at D- GDOT, if you want to make it better, go do it. You know, mm-hmm. there's nothing holding you back. There is absolutely nobody's going to say you shouldn't do this because it's good. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe some of your ideas don't work, but at least you tried. You know, yeah. let's go ahead and try it and let's see where it goes. And and a lot of the times on these projects, too, we'll start in one direction and it may pivot and to get a better outcome that's slightly different than you began, but it was because you were working and trying to make it better. And as I said this morning, our team probably is tired of me hearing me say that. I always say, you know, can we just make it better? All right, how can we make it better? Let's continue to learn and grow and make it better. And if we can do that, we can make transportation better for Georgia. And that's our Absolutely. goal. Well, that should be all of our goals, right? Yeah. Uh, what is it, uh, good to great? Good is the enemy of great, Yeah, correct. you know? How can you make it better? And right. and to have a culture that, you know, takes that learning opportunity. A lot of places would have that learning opportunity, and they'd come up with their project, and that would be the end of it. Yeah, good job. To actually Put it take on the shelf. that, yeah. and give them the opportunity to partner yeah. with a leader and implement it is 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 truly remarkable. Yeah. Really cool. There's a lot of accountability in that program, and one of the things they do is each each uh, of the attendees uh, has to hand me an individual improvement plan of things that they learn and they're going to focus on. And then personal to them, personal, personal, that person. And I, I actually read those and email them usually about a year later, maybe a little, sometimes a little more than a year later <laughs> to see how's it going. What, how's it, did, did you hit your marks? Is there anything I can help you with? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a tremendous program and, a lot of the little wisdoms and nuggets I shared today came from my experience in that program back in probably about 1996 or seven. So, wow. you know, so uh, good. As I said, I learned a lot from a lot of people along the way, mm-hmm. and was glad to share some of those wisdom and nuggets. And the one for leadership today is one of my favorite I shared about: you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. As a leader, you need to make the horse thirsty, right? Yeah. So, uh, absolutely, one of my favorite ones. I've already, I've already used that one twice this morning <laughs> after <laughs> a session uh, with, with with my staff. Well, well, thank you for sharing your learning with us and some of your leadership nuggets with us, uh, both this morning in the general session, but also mm-hmm. on the podcast today. Um, we appreciate you taking time to be with us uh, again, both here at the most magical place on earth, but <laughs> yes, yeah, specifically here at the podcast, and can't wait to have you back again so we can. Uh, we can Definitely. have the next episode. Well, my pleasure, and I certainly thank ACEC Georgia, uh, Sully, and uh, appreciate your leadership. I do think we have something special. I appreciate the Consultant Relations uh, Committee and all the work that's done uh, focusing on making it better. So you, you guys are right there in the wheelhouse of what I believe and partner with us uh, such that we can deliver, again, the best transportation for Georgians, and in my opinion, the best in the nation. Absolutely. And you can put that... You can tell anybody that. I, I, I can and I do. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to celebrating it at the 30th Annual Transportation Summit in December. That's correct. Yep. We'll be there. Yep. yep awesome. Yep. Well, everybody, for the Engineering Change Podcast, I'm Brett. I'm Sully. And we'll see you next time. Intro and closing music. Intention by the Down and Outs. Music used with permission. Engineering Change is a production of ACEC Georgia. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.